It's Fresh Outlook time where we talk about the most talked about topics of the week. To all of our viewers in the U.S. and abroad, we welcome you to this week's show. I'm Nia Toski. Now, if you're just joining us for the first time, we begin the show with an in-depth look at what's happening and making headlines overseas. We begin in Ukraine. There are new concerns that Russia may be preparing to invade eastern Ukraine. New satellite photos show Russian troops are digging in along the eastern border, not pulling back. Here's more on that story. A fist fight in Ukraine's parliament tempers rise between the Svoboda party members and the leaders of the Communist Party over an alleged inflammatory speech. Wasn't it you who provided a scenario and an example? It turns out you were following not an American plan, but a Russian one on how to destroy the independence of Ukraine, how to split Ukraine, and how to rob Ukraine. Several lawmakers throw punches at each other. Meanwhile, pro-Russia demonstrators continue to occupy government buildings in the eastern Ukrainian cities of Luhansk and Donetsk. What is happening here is our anti-Maidan. We want to preserve Ukraine and be a part of Russia as we are Slavic people and we just want to unite all the Slavic people. In Luhansk, demonstrators take over offices of the security services, erecting barricades. In Kharkiv, security forces drive demonstrators out of government headquarters, arresting 70 of them. The seizures of the buildings and calls for referenda are an echo of events that led to Russia's annexation of the Crimean Peninsula last month. And to talk more about the divided Ukraine, we are joined by former White House aide Didi Benke, international journalist Mustafa Tabanli, and in our D.C. studios, Tom Squiteri. We welcome all of you and thank you for being here. All right. Well, we have started Thanks to see that me. the Russians are making some infrastructure improvements with roads, and it certainly looks like they're digging in and not pulling back. Uh, Didi, this is yeah, something... Yeah, what a that, shock, right? What well, a shock. Does this come as a surprise? Of course, Putin was saying there's no way that's going to happen, but now it yeah, looks I don't, like... Yeah, I don't think it's a surprise. I think he's lying. I mean, you know, he has said over and over again, you know, I, he wants to uh, expand, and he said, I want to protect our people, really. Well, what's that got to do with building roads, and what's that got to do with putting troops in there and you know it's just very obvious that he wants to expand Russia like it used to be in the day and it, you know and when you have infrastructure that's a lot of money that's a big investment for the future I think there was even a satellite image that showed that there was a soccer field uh, to keep the troops entertained there <laughs> uh, Mustafa your thoughts I think the, there was this uh, international concept of sanctity of Second World War uh, borders, so that was like overall uh, sanctity and let's not touch this. But it's, it's, it's been gone and now that may jump into other places, like if it's Ukraine, maybe now it's in the Syria or in the Iraq or maybe in Estonia, or who knows next. So Anywhere he can get away with. He's yeah. going to push and push and push the, the borders as far as he can. Well, uh, Putin did say that he would fulfill his obligations to send natural gas to Europe, but he had did uh, have some strong words for the U.S. to keep out. Let's check in with Tom Scuteri down in D.C. And your thoughts, Tom? Well, on the gas issue, it's a very clever ruse by Putin. He doesn't want to have any kind of united front between the United States and, and the European uh, nations. So by promising to send natural gas to Germany and, and Eastern Europe and the other nations of Europe that rely on that, he's trying to drive a wedge in between what the European nations want, the short-term interests of their people, as opposed to uh, an alliance of, of uh, solidarity in, in the face of the Ukraine crisis that would, that would perhaps have a united front to slow down Russia's movement into Eastern Ukraine. Well, you know, know, we, the, we, the, uh, the United States and other, warned about the dependency on Russian gas now for decades, and everyone has not heeded that advice and everyone thought they could trust the Russians. I believe, as, as the other two guests have already indicated, uh, trusting Putin is, is really a fool's, is like fool's gold. You're not going to get anything at the end. Well, I want to talk about some of Putin's motives, if we really uh, know them. Obviously, Ukraine is a source of food and a transit hub for Russian energy exports and obviously a very um, an economic and strategic partner for, for Russia. Now, many say that mm -hmm. Putin is, cares about the Eurasian trade union and that is that he wants that to be his legacy. Do you think that is true, or do you think that he wants is, is looking for his legacy to be that Russia is this giant in the world? Well, I think uh, well, that trade union you meant. Oh, sorry. Well, go no, ahead. no, Tom, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the trade union is just one piece of what he hopes will be his legacy. Uh, legacy is important to Putin as it is to any Russian leader. 
uh, supremacy in Russia or the Soviet Union is first, and from that, the hemorrhage of the legacy uh, spills from that. Putin sees what's happening, for example, to former leader Gorbachev, who may stand trial for his crimes, quote unquote, crimes on the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, Putin does want that to happen. So any way that he can control and improve superficially the, the, uh, the outlook that Russians have for their country, as well as those neighbors, the little brothers of the Slavs of Russia, to depend on them, that just boosts his entire legacy. Let's talk about that also. Now, what if, what if Ukraine were to split? Uh, we've, got, we've got troops over there. Um, they've only been really a unified country since 1991. What if they did split? I think he's just picking up the pieces. I mean, he's going to try to split, take over part of the Ukraine, and then it's much easier because you're already there to take over all of it. So that's obviously his plan, and he's encroaching very quickly. It's amazing, and he's just saying, hey, what are you all going to do about it? What are you going to do, United States? He's daring everyone. I mean, it's really stunning yeah. what and he's if, doing. If you go back, you can go back to Georgia. It all started over there. Yeah. And then it goes to Iran, and he was the one who pushed the nuclear deal with them. Then the Syria, he won the... Uh, chemical uh, warfare front and made the deal. So every front, step by step, step by step, you see him uh, re getting the winner. Yeah, it's very strategic. I mean, yeah. look, I mean, he knows what he's doing. It seems like this has been a plan for a very long time. Very long well, time. I, yeah, absolutely. Now, Germany has maintained a, a relatively decent relationship with Russia. Why is Barack Obama not able to handle Vladimir Putin? I just, he, I, it's, he has so mishandled this. I mean, he is completely weak. I just think he, he either doesn't care, doesn't know what to well, do. Well, I, I, I can't say that fail. he doesn't care. Well, he, then why isn't he doing anything? I don't think he does care. I think he cares about Obamacare. He couldn't care less what's going on in other countries. I, it, there's no other explanation unless he's just that inept. Well, the, the, the only major player here is the energy cartel that uh, controls the oil prices, gas prices, etc. And... I don't think either Obama nor Putin can uh, just uh, go against them. So even like Putin is th threatening not to send gas or whatever, he's not the only player there. You have British Petrol, Exxon Mobil, etc., and they don't listen to nobody. <laughs> well, well, good point. <laughs> uh, now, Tom, we want to just get your way in on your thoughts on this also. Now, we've, uh, we're have we talking about, of course, Barack Obama and why he has been not able to handle Vladimir Putin. I think part of the reason that he's having trouble with Putin is the same way George W. Bush had trouble with him, is they, they wish for the best, and that's not going to be the case with Putin. I don't believe there's any consistency in a game plan or a relationship idea of what the United States wants to have vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And that's part of the issue. If you don't know your goals, you sort of stumble along and try to be reactive as opposed to being proactive and thoughtful. Uh, in the conversation earlier about Ukraine being maybe cut in half, for example, I think people should be sitting around anticipating all the possibilities. When I was a foreign correspondent, we'd go down a road in Bosnia or some conflict zone, and we'd try to think of every possible thing that could happen and then prepare for that. Now, obviously, things happen that you don't expect, but you're ready. I don't see that in this administration in regards to, in case of Russia or the Ukraine, and, and other parts of the world, as, uh, as uh, other people have said. So I think that's part of the issue is that there's no game plan, there's no thoughtful process of these events could happen, this is how we should position ourselves for our long-term interests in the United States as well as that of our friends and allies. Well, Tom, that's a great point, and I want to ask you another question, and, and it, it pertains to something that you touched on, you okay. know, Putin's next moves. Let's talk about some of the things that Putin wants. Uh, he definitely wants uh, the Ukraine out of the EU. Why? Well, in part because uh, if, you, if Ukraine is in the EU, much like the nations that were once under the Iron Curtain countries, NATO is probably next in, in some form or fashion. And that means that the Western uh, alliance is right on the border of Russia. I'm sure your two guests there, and as others have said in your show in the past, they all, we all agree that that's one of the historical nightmares of Russia to have a, a foreign power right on their border. They want this buffer zone. Uh, for protection. So the EU offers economic incentives, a better improved way of life for the Ukrainians and others. That is dreadful to the Russians because they really cannot promise that at all. There's no way that their economic union can match the potential and the reality of what the European Union can bring to a nation. 
that's, that's something he can't handle or compete against, so he has to get them out of there. Well, one of the questions that has been brought up also is, should the U.S. invest in a growing number of young people that really understand Russian politics like we have invested in young people who understand Chinese politics? Well, I tell you what, I was a history major, and I'm so upset because the one area I did not study was, was the Russian history. So, you know, it, we really don't think about it like that. And it is the focus is on China, and it's focused on the Middle East. But, yeah, man, I definitely think we need to do that now. I think education sure. is yeah, this. But, but also, uh, you, have, you have to invest on Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Yakutistan, and all those neighboring Russian countries. If you focus on Russia, it's too narrow. You have to... Uh, Ukraine, Georgia, you have to go back to Georgia, what we did wrong, and then study and uh, have more think tanks on those issues. It's That's interesting, a, though, in school, don't we, for whatever reason, we, uh, it seems like there's not a big focus no. on this, but it really should be. I mean, we kind of missed the boat on this one, I'm afraid. Uh, we do have to, uh, so we're going to switch to another topic very quickly. We did talk about uh, Mustafa, about Syria. Uh, but of course, th this month uh, marks three years since the start of the Syrian conflict. The United Nations now estimates more than 100 million, uh, well, sorry, 100,000 people dead and millions displaced. And Syria quietly continues to grow in intensity and scope. And the question is, with the conflict in Ukraine, a lot of people have put Syria on the back burner now. It's really sad. I mean, people really are not talking about Syria. They don't know what's going on. And there's so much unrest in the world now. So in Syria, may I, you know, it, it, it sounds like it's the most brutal. And we're just not even talking about it. So it's unfortunate. Well, this, this week, of course, you had the, the Dutch priest that was shot dead mm -hmm. uh, in homes. And uh, that certainly uh, made some international headlines. But the question is, has, has Ukraine buried the chance of peace in Syria? Well, I think, uh, like I said, uh, if, you, if you focus on Ukraine, then you will lose Ukraine, and then you're going to focus on whatever Russia is going to move, and like he said, re retroactive or like make a reaction to it. You have to go back, t take back Syria, take back a nuclear deal with Iran, take back Georgia, and think about them again and again, and how to proceed, and make good allies, Absolutely. basically. Well, in the United States, you know, the, I mean, the, we're the pushing together. The challenge in all of this is the fact that Russia uh, has uh, the ability to say no. And the power to say no is often uh, exaggerated in strength than the ability to say yes, because you could say no and you could stop things by not participating, by throwing roadblocks in the way. It's much more difficult to achieve a positive solution. The Russians take advantage of it. It's a great manifestation of the idea of tin horn authority, that someone has a little bit of power and they maximize that in the opportunity of that moment in time or place. Well, just the, the, what's happening over there in terms of uh, Syria, but also Lebanon. The population there has grown by 25%. Yeah. Even in Turkey, you're seeing so many more people. So the question is, what is the future for those countries and as the refugees continue to spill over? And those are like resentful people. I would they say not very much. good because when you yeah, get refugees coming into your country, there's just a spillover and they destabilize the political resources, I'm sorry, the infrastructure resources, as well as then upset the political equilibrium in the country because of their different ideas help us help us and the people in the country then who are natives get resentful of the refugees a strain on resources a strain on the politics it's just not healthy for anyone around uh, final thoughts Didi well I just think it's very fragile right now everywhere in the world so it's just you know let's hope for let's hope for better things and for a new president because there's a void now before we had good leadership with Obama doing nothing there's just a void yeah. And Mustafa? Like I said, you have to t think, t take the bigger picture. You have to think Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Georgia, rethink Syria. And uh, it's not a lost war. You just keep on investing and changing your policy and have good allies, I would say. And Tom, final thoughts from you in D.C. I think we should be grateful to Vladimir Putin because he's the most honest person in the world by showing us exactly what he's going to do. <laughs> Don't listen to what he yeah, says. He's saying that a long Just time ago, what wasn't he? he? Do, and we know what's going to happen next. Yeah, he told us. <laughs> all right. He's been talking she about knew, this for a long time. three years ago. <laughs> yeah, right. Tom, thank you so much for all your uh, wonderful insights. And don't go away, everyone. When we come back, we're going to travel to Washington, D.C., where the Turkic American Alliance held its fourth annual conference. Now, why is it so important? We'll talk it out after this short break.